And I'm going to talk about refining early detection and predicting outcomes of primary treatment. And uh, really in this context, or in, the, in the context of these two topics, refining early detection to improve screening, I think that there's lessons learned in this arena that relate to the notion that earlier molecular profiling is something that potentially can really inform and help us refine care and care decisions. And in the case of uh, what I'll discuss today, we're going to really take that to the ultimate extreme, the notion of molecular profiling in a pre-diagnostic setting. And then secondly, I'll talk about discerning early stage treatment options and outcomes with a, a focus on quality of life and side effects. And there again, I think the paradigm is the notion that predicting a patient's uh, side effects and predicting treatment toxicity is something that can ultimately, again, help us improve and refine our decision making about for example, systemic treatment options that might be emerging uh, as, uh, as we move forward, as we heard earlier today. So in terms of prostate cancer early detection, we're all familiar with the double-edged sword of PSA screening, the controversial and uh, sometimes uh, uh, incongruous information about whether or not PSA screening actually saves lives, uh, really uh, represented nicely uh, between uh, the findings of the PLCO study as opposed to the ERSPIC study with one showing an overall survival benefit in ERSPIC and PLCO not confirming that, recognizing that there were potential limitations of these studies, but ultimately, even in the best case scenario of the ERSPIC study and the Swedish extension of that trial, we're still looking at a setting of somewhere in the neighborhood of 10 to 40 uh, men treated for every life saved. So clearly there's a need to improve, to refine, and to be uh, more discerning in terms of early detection and can we perhaps bring a molecular profiling strategy uh, into, the, um, into the picture in order to help us with that? Well, actually, even before we bring into the picture the notion of new molecular targets for early detection, uh, really an uh, underlying question is can we simply do better with what we already have in hand in terms of PSA tests and routine clinical factors that are available to us? And I'll just touch base on, on that quickly before moving on to some of the newer molecular targets for detection. So in this slide, uh, what I show is that simply by taking uh, better stock of what we know about PSA, uh, taking into account other clinical factors like patient obesity, family history, size of the prostate, we can do a better job in predicting, in, in particular, which patients are likely to have aggressive cancers, cancers with a hist histology that's going to have Gleason score 7 or worse, presence of perinolar invasion, or other factors known to portend a poor uh, clinical prognosis and potential need for treatment. And so even if we were to adopt some fairly basic approaches to improving or refining whether a abnormal PSA leads to biopsy, for example, these factors, we could eliminate up to a quarter of biopsies, unnecessary biopsies that are done today. So we do have the potential to improve even on just the use of PSA alone. But moving beyond PSA, there's, of course, new potential opportunities for uh, molecular uh, tests to help us inform who should undergo a prostate biopsy and perhaps to look into new strategies for prostate cancer screening. And I'll just talk briefly, uh, focus mostly on two of these, the urinary PECA3 test and the Tempus Erg uh, fusion evaluation. Both of these are approaches where we take into uh, post-digital uh, post rectal exam urines as a, really the platform for uh, attaining what amounts to a pre-diagnostic molecular fingerprint of what's going on in a man's prostate. So first, PCA3. PCA3 is a, uh, is a uh, RNA, it's a non-coding RNA, initially termed DD3, which was initially discovered in the late 1990s on some differential display RNA studies um, in uh, prostate tissue specimens from Johns Hopkins. Later on in uh, the Netherlands, uh, it was found that uh, this uh, non-coding uh, RNA sequence could actually be detected using PCR techniques, RT-PCR techniques in patient urine samples. And then a company uh, in California, Genprobe, licensed the uh, intellectual property on that and developed a uh, clinical grade assay, and actually the commercial assay is available even in advance of any type of FDA approval for that. We uh, in the uh, NCI Early Detection Research Network, a a multi-center group set up by NIH to try to explore and develop new and better molecular evaluation and, and detection approaches and strategies to a variety of cancers. We undertook a multi-center study 
of PCA3 performance, really asking the very basic question of can it improve upon PSA in terms of predicting which men are likely to have prostate cancer on biopsy if they're found to have an abnormal PSA or an abnormal DRE. The schema of the trial, it's a pretty straightforward study, a multi-center uh, study of both academic and community urology practices. Uh, patients are enrolled uh, before they undergo prostate biopsy. Their post-DR urine is collected. We also collect blood for PSA sampling at that point. They undergo prostate biopsy, then they're categorized as to their cancer or non-cancer status and the aggressiveness of the cancer based on routine histopathology. And the endpoint is really to assess the performance of the PCA3 test as compared to PSA. Um, so what I, what I can share with you is this trial just uh, completed accrual um, last week. So it's just been closed to accrual with 880 patients. The um, principal component of the study, that being the evaluation of men who have not had a prior uh, biopsy in their prostate initial, men presenting for initial biopsy, uh, looked encouraging at the interim analysis where ROC for uh, PCA3 uh, was 0 0.81, and we're awaiting the complete analysis of the full sample set, and we'll probably have the data about just how PCA3 stacks up against PSA in the coming months, but the initial information we have looks very encouraging. And really, it's not uh, uh, an issue here, I think, of PCA3 being the be-all and end-all of urinary markers for prostate cancer, but really, I think it's, a, it's an initial prototype and it really uh, provides a proof of principle, if you will, that post-digital rectal exam urine samples may in fact be a, a very uh, fruitful and uh, productive direction in terms of allowing us to uh, sample and profile molecularly what's going on in a man's prostate even before they undergo a prostate biopsy. And so next on, uh, on the block following PCA3, in terms of some obvious potential molecular targets that we know have significant specificity for prostate cancer are not found in normal prostate tissue is, of course, tempus erg uh, gene fusion, genetic rearrangement that all of us here are now familiar with, uh, found some uh, discovered and uh, described initially some six years ago uh, from a group at University of Michigan. And uh, what... Uh, Shown here in FISH, uh, there's some evidence, at least from European cohorts, that the presence of the tempus erg fusion may in fact relate not only to whether or not a patient has cancer, but potentially in the setting of untreated prostate cancer, and this has really not been corroborated in the treated setting, but in untreated surveyed prostate cancer cohort here from Sweden, presence of the tempus erg uh, fusion uh, portended a poorer prognosis in terms of eventual lethality as opposed to prostate cancers where that fusion was absent. So the potential is there for the fusion to provide a avenue not only for detection, but also potentially for selective detection in terms of the subsequent biological uh, behavior of those cancers. So we have gone on and uh, demonstrated that uh, the tempus erg fusion uh, can be detected in post-DR urines. And in a study, uh, in just a, a small pilot study shown here, uh, where we evaluated uh, some 40 uh, patients with RT-PCR techniques, patients who presented with either a low PSA under 10 or high PSA, just categorized as less than or, or greater than 10. We evaluated their PCA3 status by RT-PCR, T2-ERG status by RT-PCR. Again, this is in post-DR urines before the patients undergo a biopsy. And then use that information to inform what then, how then would that predict uh, the probability of prostate cancer on the subsequent biopsy? And were these, assay, were these molecular assays ones that could be used in combination to help better select, number one, who has prostate cancer, and then potentially secondarily, what the aggressiveness or molecular characteristics of that disease might be? And indeed, we found that the combination of having absent PCA3 and absent T or uh, RNA in post dr urine samples in a setting of men with abnormal PSA, higher than 2.5, but less than 10 in that in somewhat poor performing range of PSA, uh, th these urinary tests were indeed quite informative in terms of indicating a 1% uh, only a 1% risk of uh, prostate cancer being present. So we took that information to a larger study. Uh, GenProbe has gone on and uh, based on this and other data, uh, developed a, uh, a commercial grade, clinical grade uh, assay for the tempus erg fusion that is analogous to their assay for PCA3. And we're really poised now to potentially evaluate this 
um, again, in that same clinical trial sample set of 880 patients for whom the PCA3 status has been ascertained, we will have the opportunity to evaluate in those same urine samples how the tempers erg uh, detection in those samples might inform the status of their uh, and findings on their subsequent prostate biopsy. In an initial uh, pilot study of that, we evaluated 306 samples, and there again, using now the commercial a great assay from GenProbe rather than laboratory-based RT-PCR work uh, found that, again, a, a combination of a tempers erg evaluation and PCA3 evaluation had a favorable uh, area under the curve and sensitivity and specificity profile as compared to PSA in predicting whether or not uh, prostate cancer was present and at a sensitivity of just over 80 percent, achieved a substantial improvement in specificity uh, of 60 percent as compared to a specificity of 23 percent for PSA alone at that level of sensitivity. And this is indeed what you'd really expect a good molecular marker to enable you to do if it has good specificity for prostate cancer. I think our first mission is to eliminate unnecessary biopsies. Uh, and then secondly, and importantly, is going to be the evaluation of these and potentially other molecular markers, such as those discussed earlier by Ron and others, as to the potential for discerning and refining, refining biopsy, not just to those patients who are at risk based on their urinary profile for having prostate cancer, but who are actually at risk for having an aggressive variant and potentially informing the subsequent treatment of those variants based on pre-diagnostic tests of uh, those patients post-DRE urine samples. And this is really just summarized uh, in this slide here, that ultimately we do see PCA3 as having substantial promise based on current data. Uh, we are poised to evaluate the tempers erg uh, fusion uh, in uh, uh, post-DRE urine samples as well, but ultimately I think there's, the real future is going to be in combining these with other potential molecular markers, including ones that might predict response to therapy. Okay, well, what about the patient then who's diagnosed with prostate cancer, and um, how do we go about uh, deciding what their initial treatment might be, and specifically for per patients with early stage disease, are there some paradigms that we've explored in this space that potentially could be useful as we look forward to more advanced disease states and the notion of trying to decide between the various different treatments that are getting approved by FDA, uh, systemic therapies that may have very different side effect profiles. And, you know, what I'll share with you next is some work that we've done looking at how patient baseline status can be used to predict uh, their quality of life outcomes and the potential for them to have side effects in the setting of early stage disease. And what I'd ask you to do is just imagine, if you will, that if we had similar types of abilities to evaluate and uh, and processes to evaluate baseline status and quality of life among men with more advanced disease, that that may also very well allow and improve our ability to make decisions about which of the myriad of potential systemic treatment options might be, uh, might be appropriate and best for individual patients, not taking a broad brush and saying, well, everybody needs to have uh, uh, taxane first, followed by uh, abiraterone and a vaccine thereafter, but really taking patients' individual information, not just on the one hand, their molecular profile, that might, uh, that might predict the uh, prospects for their biological response, but also their side effect and lifestyle profile, that might predict uh, their, uh, uh, their consequence in terms of the quality of life effects and impact of the treatment. And so in the early stage setting, we certainly had a chance to explore this. Uh, we did a study uh, that was a prospective multi-center uh, piece of work uh, um, uh, described a couple of years ago in publication in the New England Journal. Uh, called the Prosecuted Consortium. It was over 1,000 patients at uh, um, eight or nine uh, academic centers. Uh, patients were uh, distributed between about half who had prostatectomy and the other half uh, who were equally divided uh, between external beam radiation and brachytherapy. All of these patients with early stage disease, stage T1 or T2, uh, uh, N0 disease, uh, where we evaluated their quality of life prior to treatment and in a continuous fashion thereafter, with really one of the eventual goals being to, uh, to ask the question of can we use the patient's baseline features to predict how they're going to do in terms of their outcome, not only their treatment, but also other aspects of their baseline. And, and one of the advantages of, of using patient report instruments, and I'll just show this slide as an example of um, measuring, uh, in this case, a urinary outcome uh, both at uh, a baseline and then in continued follow-up. Uh, on the y-axis here is the 
uh, quantitative uh, quality of life score of the patients. And so you'll go beyond just a question of simply yes or no, does the patient have incontinence, but actually uh, get, of course, a um, quantifiable score that combines the patient responses to uh, several uh, questions uh, that uh, query urinary incontinence, and then you can uh, monitor really uh, with greater sensitivity the impact of their treatment early on and the recovery thereafter in the case of prostatectomy. And in the case of urinary incontinence, uh, very much less, if any, effect on that by radiation and some effect in later cases by brachytherapy. On the other hand, urinary obstruction, another aspect of patient's quality of life that can turn out to be important in terms of the decision making, as I'll show you momentarily. Uh, you see potentially some small effects when you look at a group of uh, prostatectomy patients as a whole, but nothing particularly striking. In the case of external radiation, perhaps some initial detriment followed by recovery, and in the case of uh, brachytherapy, potentially a little bit more long-term uh, side effects on their urinary obstructive profile. But this is data kind of showing the conglomerate of an entire cohort, and uh, it turns out that there's really much more value uh, when we drill down and ask the question, well, what type of factors can inform us as to which of the patients, even within the prostatectomy group or within the radiation group, are going to respond, and are they going to respond differently, or this is just, it's just this, the classic profile for all men. And so one of the things that it turns out was really a strong driver for how patients did uh, was uh, uh, simply the baseline uh, status of the patients in terms of their urinary function. And it may seem like a no-brainer, but uh, as much of a no-brainer as it may seem, it's not something that really has been evaluated to a great extent uh, previously, at least not in the terms of looking at the question of how can we predict which patients might have an overall uh, uh, favorable or unfavorable impact on their overall urinary functioning, for example, in combining the concept of incontinence and the concept of urinary uh, obstruction or irritation. And so if we look at patients' pretreatment obstructive symptoms, just simply stratifying by their AUA symptom index really brings to bear some, some substantial differences in terms of how we might counsel patients in terms of how they might do. So for the prostatectomy or the, or the radiation patient uh, who has uh, excellent urinary functioning with a low AUA symptom index at baseline, uh, they're likely to start out at, a, at an excellent uh, uh, place in terms of their urinary quality of life with essentially no problems there, and a small but significant proportion can expect that to worsen. On the other hand, we have patients who have an AOA symptom index where they do have some urinary troubles, urinary frequency, nocturia and such. We can actually see improvement from the prostatectomy patients, perhaps stability for the patients with, who get radiotherapy. And I think most interestingly, you get a scenario where you have patients who might have not just obstructive symptoms, but also are already being treated at baseline. And in those patients, the picture really changes rather drastically. So whereas Patients who might not have a lot of urinary problems at the get-go, we might be counseling them about getting worse. On the other hand, for patients who really are troubled with, uh, with nocturia frequency and the like at baseline, you actually can see substantial improvement where the notion of the primary treatment not only not necessarily just causing side effects, but potentially uh, eliminating or improving in some cases uh, based on the baseline status, the potential income for the potential outcome for uh, specific patients. And so in this way, informing the patients based on how they're doing at baseline can potentially really facilitate that patient's understanding of what's going to come about and uh, help them uh, decide better between their various treatment options. And again, I think this is the type of thing where, if applied in the systemic treatment uh, setting in later stage disease, might prove to be useful in that scenario as well. Just a, a moment about uh, sexuality and sexual outcome. Uh, here, um, again, showing over time the notion that we can quantify how patients do with initial substantial deficit after prostatectomy with erection uh, status and sexual quality of life, potential partial improvement depending on the nerve sparing status thereafter. With radiation therapy, we see a, a substantial difference in the outcomes depending on whether or not the patients receive hormonal therapy uh, together with their radiation. And so uh, in this case, we show that the treatment can obviously affect differently how the patient's outcome is going to uh, play out um, as to whether or not they have nurse pairing, whether they, or not they have hormonal therapy. And given some of the soft data about the differences in overall survival uh, between whether or not hormonal therapy is used, say, in a 
early intermediate risk disease setting, uh, this can be uh, something that can be useful for patients in terms of their decisions with their physicians as to whether or not, for example, they should undergo hormonal therapy, whether or not they should have uh, nerve sparing or such. But again, I think more importantly is the notion that the baseline status uh, drives the outcome as much, if not more so, than the type of treatment that's being given. And this again is where I come back to uh, the question that I had uh, asked previously about some of the systemic treatments where um, I think there's a lot to be gained potentially for asking, okay, what baseline patient factors, be they clinical factors or quality of life factors, uh, uh, influence whether or not patients are gonna have a particular toxicity. And in the case here of a sexual outcome, you can see where patients who have really near perfect erections at the get-go are, are gonna be looking at a, a much uh, substantially reduced chance of uh, erectile dysfunction, that being just under 50%, as opposed to patients who even have just average erections or erections that are a little bit worse than baseline when they're starting out. And that is irrespective of the treatment type they have and really something that's driven by their baseline status. So I think ultimately, though, these quality of life tools in terms of informing the patient decisions can only be as useful as they are practical uh, and in the past, I think one of the things that has impeded our ability to bring this to bear in the typical routine, busy clinical practice setting is the lack of instruments that are really uh, friendly uh, both to the patient and the physician as something that can be given quickly, efficiently, and can be used on an immediate point of care uh, basis uh, to help uh, a decision making. And that really has not existed. By and large, the quality of life instruments that are available for these purposes have been multi-page uh, type of uh, questionnaires, oftentimes uh, 20 or 30 questions. They typically rely on, uh, back, uh, on analysis on the back end to transform them to a, a zero to 100 scoring system. So uh, just a simple exercise that we went through recently was to modify uh, what has turned into one of the gold standards for early stage prostate cancer quality of a life assessment, the EPIC instrument, uh, which had had 26 items and again was a four or five page uh, instrument that, re that required a transformation to a zero to 100 scale. We really just modified it based on the example uh, and uh, the lead that's been established by the AOA Symptom Index, the IPSS. And, and as I think all of us know who take care of men with prostate cancer, uh, the uh, IPSS is uh, a, a very helpful tool in terms of assessing, if nothing else, the status of patients' BPH symptoms. And it's very useful and, and uh, easy to use in the practice setting, allowing the physician to really score it immediately at the practice site. So what we've done is modify the EPIC instrument into a one-page instrument where we retain the ability to measure these five domains, incontinence, obstruction, bowel rectal functioning, sexual status, and hormonal and vitality outcome. And, uh, and in this new one-page format, found it to be essentially a five-minute questionnaire. And um, I'll just show that. Which essentially allows the physician to score in real time, just like the IPSS. Each of the 10 questions, representing 16 items, uh, gets a, a one to four score entered in the side here. And then those scores are added up to give a score of anywhere from zero to 12 for each of the five uh, domains of the EPIC quality of life instrument. And that's something that we hope will make it a little bit easier to implement the use of the quality of life assessment, both as a baseline issue and in terms of follow-up after treatment. So finally, I'd like to just acknowledge uh, many of the people who've taken part in both our EDRN work and our quality of life work, and I'd be happy to, uh, to take any uh, questions. Thanks.